greatest single fact to emerge from today's world war, a struggle which has revolutionized so many old concepts of warfare, is the enormous effectiveness of air power, both in land fighting and sea fighting. Today, over all the oceans of the world, airmen of the United States Navy on patrol duty and in combat are playing a decisive part in the war at sea. And in calculations of the Navy's tacticians and strategists, the Air Force is ranked no longer as a mere auxiliary, but as a full partner with the surface fleets. Tell plane 11 to change his course and take a look at Area Roger. We've got a new fix on that sub. Aye, sir. To build its great Air Force, the Navy can call and has called upon the best of America's young manhood. For naval aviation has behind it a proud tradition of courage and gallantry, of pioneering and adventure that has captured the imagination of the nation's air-minded youth. Within the short lifetime of most of these youngsters, it has grown from a groping experimental organization occupied with what most men dismissed as impractical dreams into a mighty force which is today helping to reshape the destiny of the world. Preserved in the Navy files at Washington, on films and on paper, is the story of naval aviation and of the pioneers who paved the way for it. Men who shared a vision and who had the daring and courage and imagination to turn their vision into reality. These files, these pictures, constitute an eloquent record of the unbelievably crude beginnings out of which the science of aeronautics was developed. And man was launched upon one of his most audacious and long sought conquests, conquest of the air. Washington Smithsonian Institution, the government has gathered together to preserve for posterity more records and evidence of the faltering steps by which man advanced from his first tentative flights to mastery of the air. Here may still be seen some of the earliest planes, clumsy perilous contraptions of fabric and wood, propelled by weak and sputtering engines, which carried men like Wilbur and Orville Wright, Glenn Curtis, Ely and Ellison into the air. Here too are models of the fragile and inadequate machines out of whose failures and uncertain successes was to come the knowledge that made the U.S. Naval Air Force possible. And with them are records of the great pioneers in naval aviation, men like Captain Washington Irving Chambers, who more than any other is the one who gave the Navy its wings. At his incentive, the Navy first began experimenting with aircraft and the development of the hydroplane or flying boat. It was due to Captain Chambers that the Navy was ready when the First World War came with even the beginnings of an Air Force. And though in 1915 it had possessed but 17 planes, its hurriedly expanded seaplane squadrons made an important contribution to the Allied cause by their work in patrolling the French coasts and hunting submarines in the English Channel. During the war, the Navy's complement of men and planes grew from 38 pilots and 54 planes to over 2,000 planes and 3,000 pilots. As different types of planes were developed for different tasks, there emerged three main categories of naval combat aircraft. The large seaplane or flying boat 
with its longer range and lesser dependency on its operating base, was to become the patrol craft. The seaplane was still an imperfect and unpredictable instrument when, under Commander J.H. Towers, today an admiral, the U.S. Navy flyers undertook in 1919 the first flight across the Atlantic. What no man had ever dared attempt before was accomplished by one of these planes, the NC-4, when after a fabulous flight across the sea to Portugal by way of the Azores, it arrived in Plymouth, England. Its crew, headed by Lieutenant Commander A.C. Reed, another pioneer who is an admiral today, was received in triumph by the Lord Mayor and thousands of cheering citizens. With the Atlantic conquered, another and greater long distance flight across the immense Pacific became the Navy's ambition. The historic flight to Hawaii under Commander John Rogers in 1925 established a record of 1,800 miles of continuous flying and blazed a trail to be traveled with scheduled regularity sooner than anyone would have then believed possible. Naval aviators were gaining new confidence. They knew what they and their planes could do. Flying was no longer a dangerous and uncertain undertaking. Its success dependent upon many unpredictable factors. Meanwhile, U.S. naval officers had already begun experimenting with a new device designed to free naval planes from reliance on shore bases. The principles of catapulting, developed through endless experiments with full-scale models, were finally proven by courageous airmen who took their lives in their hands to demonstrate that the catapult really worked. Thus, it became possible to add to the Naval Air Force short-range scout and observation planes to operate from and work with ships of the fleet enormously extending the fleet's effective range of action. From the catapult to the aircraft carrier, making possible the use of fast fighters and bombers in sea warfare was a logical step. With the first flights from an improvised deck on a battleship, the conviction grew among a few pioneer flyers that planes could successfully take off from and land on ships at sea. Since aircraft carriers as yet existed only in the imaginations of a few men, the Navy conducted its tests on land. Any idea that looked as though it might work was given a trial. But by 1922, the Navy had a carrier, the USS Langley. To Lieutenant Commander Godfrey Chevalier went the honor of making the first landing on the Langley, a landing which proved there was much to learn. To the pioneers, flying had become a religion. Despite the great personal risks involved, they were determined to perfect, by trial and error, a dependable technique.
Within two years, planes were flying off the Langley with routine precision. Operating principles had been standardized. The Navy found out that planes could do invaluable work with the fleet. Models of proposed types of planes were made and test flown in the Navy's first crude wind tunnel, where an idea of their airworthiness could be estimated. High standards of aerial gunnery grew out of target practice, in which new type machine guns, built especially for aerial combat, proved their worth. In training schools, much practical experience was gained in the study of airplane engines. And in time, a small but highly competent group of aircraft. Students learned their aerodynamics from instructors who were still feeling their way along, from theory to theory, and were as often wrong as right. We are now definitely of the opinion that the use of brakes on airplane wheels is impractical. The sudden checking of speed when brakes are applied causes the plane to ground loop. Always alert to the development of aircraft of type, the Navy early experimented with lighter-than-air ships. The early blimps of the Navy operated with such good effect that soon great airships were in use, ships capable of staying aloft for days at a time. The potent backer of the airships was Rear Admiral William A. Moffat, who, along with H.V. Wiley and Charles E. Rosendahl, had the vision and energy to encourage the development of new ideas, such as the use of the airship as an airborne hangar for fighting planes. the early 20s, when the Navy's first fighter squadron was formed, the use of specialized types of planes for special duties was an accepted principle of military aviation. Along with fighters, there were the Curtis Hell Divers, in which Corps flyers originated dive bombing and developed it into a technique of deadly efficiency in the war at sea. The Navy pioneered in the development of torpedo planes that could carry a one-ton aerial torpedo. But many an unsuccessful run was made in the early days before all the problems of dropping torpedoes from the air could be solved and a technique developed which ensured consistently accurate results. In the Navy Department, air power had become an accepted auxiliary to sea power. And when the Washington Arms Conference halted construction of the half-built battlecruisers Lexington and Saratoga, the Navy was quick to convert them to aircraft carriers. In 
Into these ships went all the ingenuity and inventiveness of American shipbuilders and engineers. On their spacious flight decks, thousands of takeoffs and landings were to be made. Thousands of men to learn the secrets of carrier operation. For years, the Lexington was destined to serve with her sister ship, the Saratoga, as a proving ground for new ideas, new types of planes, and new techniques of operation with the fleet until carrier flying in the United States Navy became synonymous with speed and efficiency. Stimulated by the Navy's need for ever better and faster planes, the development of all types of naval aircraft made rapid progress. The Navy's standard fighter, a maneuverable biplane, was one of the first planes in the world to be equipped with retractable landing gear. Direct descendants of these fighters are the famed Wildcats of 1943. As streamlined all-metal monoplanes replaced the old biplanes, the speed of Navy planes rocket. As the range of airplanes increased to thousands of miles, giant patrol bombers took over many of the duties of warships in scouting and anti-submarine patrol. On the basis of the devastating effect of its planes on the enemy's ships and shore installations, the aircraft carrier has today taken the battleship's place as the backbone of the Navy. And coming to join the fleet's carriers are scores more now a-building, ships whose planes will write glorious pages in the history of the Navy. And that that history will be worthy of the pioneers is made certain by the men and women who today are building the Navy's planes. For the daring of a new generation of Navy pilots and their determination to win their battles must be matched at home by the determination of each aircraft and parts worker individually to do the job with all the effort and skill at his or her command. And then, and only then, will the Navy's planes fly on to certain victory.